In Christ alone my heart is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Found through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love Welcome everyone to St Saviour's Cathedral again as we celebrate the sixth Sunday of the Easter season. In our Gospel today, Jesus talks about his relationship with his Father. I and the Father are one. And we also have the commandment to love. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest, and, and peace to God's God. people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all else, we may obtain your promises that exceed all we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen. Amen.
The first reading is from Acts chapter 17, beginning at the 22nd verse. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole world, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. For the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The psalm for today is Psalm 66, beginning at verse 7, and we read by alternate half verses. O oh, bless our God, you peoples, and cause his praises to resound, who has held our souls in life, who has not suffered our feet to slip. For you have proved us, O oh God. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid sharp torment on our loins. You let our enemies ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. But you brought us out into a place of liberty. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. And I will pay you my vows. The vows that opened my lips. That my mouth uttered when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt offerings of fattened beasts with the sweet smoke of rams. I will sacrifice a bull and the flesh of goats. Come then and hear, all you that fear God. And I will tell what he has done for me. I called to him with my mouth. And his praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished wickedness in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But God has heard me. He has heeded the voice of my prayer. Praise be to God. Who has not turned back my prayer or his steadfast love from me. A reading from 1 Peter, chapter 3, beginning at the 8th verse. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called, that you might inherit a blessing. For those who desire life and desire to see good days, let them keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defence to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear. 
so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight people were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St John, chapter 14, beginning at the 15th verse. Glory Glory to you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me and those who love me will be loved by my Father and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We all know about Paul with his great endurance, troubles, hardships, and distresses. The beatings, imprisonments, and riots, his hard work, sleepless nights and hunger. So in the situation we hear about in the first reading from Acts, what was Paul thinking at Areopagus? Taking on the moral and religious high courts of Athens? He knows it's illegal to preach of a foreign deity in Athens, but does it stop him? Paul finds himself in a tight spot again. Yet, we cannot but admire his silver tongue. He cunningly avoided the trap of preaching about a foreign deity by referring to an altar, to the one that already existed, the unknown God. Paul doesn't seek to slide away from risk. He cleverly engages the Athenians in a way that they understand. If we were to continue the next two verses, we would learn, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Today and down the centuries, we are taught to preach the gospel afresh to each generation. Like St. Paul in Athens, we need to connect to our people, to our time, to our culture, to our society. Preaching the gospel afresh to each generation entails both old and new. There is the eternal gospel and the new generation. The eternal gospel 
so neatly set out by Paul to the Athenians, where he weaves in phrases from Daniel, Deuteronomy, Ecclesiastes, Job, and so on. The new generation in our time, those who say they are good when I might say I am well, or can I get when some of my generation might say, please, may I have? Paul calls the Athenians to turn away from the images made by man's design and skill. We might not now make many golden calves, but we in church can still treasure our fine buildings and glorious music, perhaps unwittingly caught up in them being the end and not a means to eternal life. According to Paul, the main thing that God was doing in Athens was shaking his head in sorrow and warning of imminent judgment because Athens was full of temples and the local people were constantly bringing sacrifices and offerings to God and goddesses of every possible kind. The God who made the whole world, Paul declares, does not live in houses made by human hands. And perhaps with a wave of his arm, we might imagine towards the Parthenon, standing majestically in the background, as it still does, as one of the wonders of the architectural world and one of the most beautiful buildings ever built. But to Paul, it misses the point. It's magnificent, but it's not God. And as for bringing animal sacrifices to the true God, well, this is the wrong way round. It is he who gives everything to us, not the other way round. Back to today. It is the job of the preacher to give suggestions as to what to do and how to interpret afresh the good news and to set out the challenge that change is likely to be necessary if we are to embrace the eternal gospel, whoever we are and wherever we may be. You see, it's one thing to travel with and watch Peter and John discover an empty tomb on Easter Day. It's quite another to enter the texts such as these. As we have moved through the Easter season, the empty tomb seems farther and farther away. The meaning of the resurrection rather than the fact of the resurrection moves to the foreground. For us, the ongoing presence of the risen Lord to successive generations in the church becomes more important than the stories of a mysterious saviour appearing here and there. Have you ever thought that there's quite a difference between believing that Jesus rose from the dead and believing in the risen Christ. Believing that Jesus rose from the dead involves looking at the resurrection from a distance, seeing it as an external event that took place a long time ago and was proven or demonstrated to the first generation of Christians in quite mysterious ways. Believing in the resurrection suggests a more intimate, personal experience. Believing in the risen Christ involves a personal relationship and the acceptance of an invitation to enter into that relationship more deeply. We are coming to the end of the Easter season, where in the Gospel reading, the risen Christ was physically with his disciples. Jesus says to them, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. This coming week, we will commemorate the Ascension and then we enter a short period where we will take on the realisation that we have responsibility passed on to us before the Spirit of Truth arrives. In his words, Jesus gives two pointers. There is the Spirit of Truth, from whom there is no hiding, and the command to love. 
such an excellent thing for us to remember as we face so much change. Whether the change concerns church doctrine around human sexuality or how to respond to our worship without the sacrament in this present time of crisis. Jesus says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. In a nutshell, Jesus is requiring that our attention is focused on him, not ourselves, and not even our church. What we keep the same, what we change, what we do, is to be focused on keeping Jesus' commands. Did you know that somewhere between 2 and 3% of the population come to Anglican churches? And add in other denominations and religions, and about 90% are not actively worshipping. So while we may not be surrounded by pagan temples, the demand for Christian witness is just as high now as it was in Athens for St Paul. Unlike Paul in his day, standing up in the town square and preaching is not quite afresh for today's society. What we can do, however, with welcome or engagement with others which are part of the vision of this cathedral, or the love shown by us in speaking or smiling at people in the street, or offering food to those in need, or the everyday going an extra step beyond our comfort zone. These are expressions of Christ's command to love and are recognised and valued as authentic Christian love. They might be small, but they are significant actions in our day as we bring the gospel afresh to others. The last three verses of the gospel reading present a wonderful circle of promises that are ours because of Jesus being with us by the Spirit. We will see him plain in the eye of faith. We will live with his life. We will know the deepest theological knowledge of all that he and the Father are in each other and that we are in him and he in us. And we will be joined to Jesus and the Father by an unbreakable bond of love. What wonderful hope we are given, especially in our secularised culture which so often seems to struggle to find hope in anything deeper than the next distraction. Giving grounds for hope becomes a crucial task for Christian believers in the face of the world climate change and in ecological destruction. Let's not forget our summer fires. In the face of manifest injustices that, for example, mean that the world's 42 richest people have the same wealth as half the world's population in the face of the hate-fueled rhetoric of populist movements that seek to divide us by ethnicity or faith or the law as we witnessed recent rioting in Melbourne. It is our calling to create signs and to sow seeds of new hope, showing that real change is possible. And that isn't about us being super strong or having all the answers. It's about us being earthed in the knowledge that he, the spirit of truth, is with you, he is in you. And living from that truth, it's about us being people with a clear conscience, living lives that do justice in so far as we are able, and humbly reflecting on our conduct and its consequences when we feel ethically compromised. It's about us connecting daily in our prayer with our own hearts, 
gratefully reflecting on our lives and the presence in them of the Lord, who never gives up on us. And it's about letting people glimpse the joyful hope within us, a hope that might just make people ask the reason why. So this week marks a turn in the season. We have subtly moved from celebrating the resurrection to the meaning of living in the age of the resurrection, an age in the spirit, with our hope of knowing the presence of Christ and the Father in us, the power of the Holy Spirit always in our midst, and the call to love and obey. Thanks be to God. Together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the world and for the church. Our God, 
We stand in your presence in these strange times. We lament a world in pain. May your spirit guide scientists, doctors and policymakers that the coronavirus very present threat may be countered and people healed. We think of those in dire situations who are at even greater risk than we may be. Those with crowded working and living conditions, in refugee camps, those without income or support. God of grace, hear our prayer. Our God, in whom we love and move and have our being, continue to bless your church at this time. In so many places, your people have been coming together in different ways. Thank you for the words and guidance of the clergy and leaders, the voices of the singers and the skills of the filmmaker. May we continue to be creative as we seek new ways of doing and being. We proclaim the gift of your spirit who stays close beside, comforter, bringer of truth. God of grace, hear yeah. our prayer. Our God, we proclaim your steadfast love. Bring healing and sustenance to those who are suffering in body, mind or spirit. Lead us all to that which nourishes and to those who bring us joy along the way. God of grace, hear yeah. our prayer. Our God, we thank you for those who have stood firm in dark times past and present. May our faith be grounded in you. Creator, redeemer and bringer of love, strengthen us to love you and walk in your ways. God of grace, hear yeah. our prayer. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father Amen. in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been offered for us. Therefore, we come to celebrate the festival. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith with a sincere and true heart. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you, set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Most glorious Lord of life, we thank you that you nourish us in these Easter mysteries. Fill us with the spirit of love and unite us in faith, that we may witness to the resurrection and show your glory in all the world. Father, we, we offer, offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. The peace of God who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. In the, In the name, name of, of Christ, Christ. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Thank you.